with the Friends of the Withlacoochee Gulf Preserve in Yankeetown, Florida, presents another speaker in its mission to promote conservation, preservation, and continuing education for all ages. Oh, wow. Well, thank you. Thank you, everyone. This is a very good group, very big group. It's awesome to see. It's been a couple of years, literally. Those past, like 2019 and 2020, have just vanished. I don't know if everybody else, but those years are just totally gone from my memory. So it's been well before that um, uh, that I was here last. Um, but I love this this resource, this important resource to the community, um, to all of the Nature Coast. So this is just fantastic to be here again. Um, my name is Nigel Rudolph. I am an archeologist with the Florida Public Archeology span Network. I actually see some familiar faces, but um, is anybody not familiar with what FPAN is, the Florida Public Archeology span Network? Some folks? So FPAN, we are a statewide, um, I think I have a slide actually, yeah. We are a statewide nonprofit uh, out of the University of West Florida in Pensacola. Um, however, I specifically go work for the University of South Florida in Tampa. I live in Gainesville, um, but our headquarters is at USF in Tampa. I cover nine counties, mine are the yellow counties there, um, cover nine counties in this area. My office, technically speaking, prior to COVID was at the uh, Crystal River Archaeological State Park. However, since then, I figured it was a better use of the taxpayer money for me to use the internet at my house rather than driving to Crystal River to use it every time. Um, so uh, I've been, for the past several years, I've been working out of my house. I have a little kid and, you know, so it's all fun and games. Um, but we cover the entire state where we have an office uh, at, at each office, each each um, host institution has two offices out of it. So we have one at FAU uh, and Flagler College. And then again at USF, we also have an office in Tallahassee that works really closely with the, with the State of Florida Division of Historical Resources. And this is our job. This is what we do. We, we do public outreach and education about Florida archeology. span Mainly uh, in the past couple of years, I've been working um, primarily in historic cemeteries and teaching a lot of workshops on how to maintain historic cemeteries throughout my, my nine counties. So I'm working closely with cemeteries in the uh, division or um, the Alachua County Historical Commission out of Gainesville on documenting uh, old historic cemeteries that are throughout Alachua County. Well, what are we gonna be talking about today? So, the timeline, this might be very general, first of all. Um, I don't want to, I don't mean to insult anybody, but I've known plenty of adults that um, can't differentiate between archaeology and paleontology. And uh, we, I don't study dinosaurs, I don't study fossils. Um, but we are going to go through a basic timeline of the indigenous people that lived here in, in Florida. Um, and then we're going to jump into what makes these ceremonial centers that we find dotted along the nature coast and essentially along the entire west coast of Florida. Florida, um, so significant and so important. We're going to kind of go into that. And being that I work closely with Crystal River, I'm going to be talking a little bit uh, more in depthly about the Crystal River site. Anybody been, anybody not been to Crystal River? The Crystal River Archaeological State Park? Awesome. You've not been? It's amazing. You should go today. <laughs> it's just down the street. Really, most importantly, uh, it's, it's really important for us to remember, being that we are going to be talking about ceremonial centers, that the, oh, sure, thank you, that the, um, the indigenous people that once occupied uh, the area that we now call Crystal River and the area that we now call Yankee Town um, are the direct descendants of, or I'm sorry, the ancestors of the folks we call the Seminole now. Um, the Seminole and Miccosukee of today uh, are the descendants of the indigenous Floridians of the past. And so the Seminole considered themselves directly connected to the indigenous people that were here prior to Spanish colonization. Um, and so we follow that lead and, 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 and we, we look at it in the same way. You may have heard the term uh, prehistoric. 
Um, the, we try not to use that term prehistoric anymore, again, because of objection from the Seminole tribe and the Miccosukee tribe. Um, they believe that these titles place the emphasis not on the people of Florida, but on the colonizers who invaded the peninsula in 1492. Um, and so we, we, we call it the ancestral period or the pre-colonial period. Um, but again, we're following their lead on how we want to teach about their ancestors. And it's very important that we do that. So again, I don't want to, you know, a lot of people, I'm sure, understand that archaeologists don't study dinosaurs. Uh, we don't study fossils. I think dinosaurs are awesome. I'm a stegosaurus guy myself. Um, but uh, I, I, we study people. And the people that we study lived a long time ago. And they, don't, they didn't have a written language, specifically talking about the indigenous people here. They didn't have a written language. So the only way we can understand about their lives and their cultures and the, and the thousands of years that they occupied this place um, is through the stuff that they left behind, is through the material culture that they left behind. And that is, when you think about Florida, um, that gives us rocks shells, bone, and ceramics, right? Those four, what we call durable materials, that's the only way we can understand these folks' life ways. Um, and each one of those can be broken down into much smaller increments, and you can get a ton of information from that. But we are trying to understand nearly 15,000 years of human occupation in the state of Florida by those four durable materials. So it's a challenge. Um, the field of archaeology is generally broken down, particularly in Florida or in the United States, is generally broken down into uh, three categories, the ancestral period, the historic period, um, which is post-European colonization, and then, of course, underwater archaeology, which everybody loves, uh, mostly kids. And what do, what do other underwater archaeologists study? Anybody want to guess? Shipwrecks. Shipwrecks. Very good. <laughs> But not only shipwrecks, um, as some of you may know, uh, and I'll go into this a little bit more in depthly later, some of you may realize that Florida um, was twice as wide as it used to be during what we call the Paleo period or the Archaic period. Um, sea levels have risen dramatically. If you look at it like this, Florida is now a single wide, but at one point it used to be a double wide. Um, from where I live in Gainesville, it was another 100 miles to get to the coast. Um, and so a lot of those people that were living along the coast, people have always lived along the coastline. Um, what do you think has happened to their villages and their, their, their places that they habitated for so long? It's all underwater, right? And so there is a whole field of uh, underwater archaeology that is not related to um, shipwrecks, but related to documenting those uh, habitation sites that are now um, on the shelf uh, uh, in deep into the Gulf of Mexico. Archaeologists are, um, there's a lot of information for us to go through, and so we, we try to organize these things in ways that um, make sense to us, in that ways we can, we can keep track of how the material culture, that is those artifacts, has changed over time. Um, and how we did that, historically, is by putting them into these different time period categories. That's not how human beings work, right? The, the paleo people didn't disappear and all of a sudden the archaic people just walked in. It wasn't like that. There was slow transfer to these different time periods. There was overlap. But this is how we're, or we've organized it and this is how we're going to discuss it today. Um, the posters are unique. Um, FPAN, for several years, we did Florida Archaeology Month posters um, where we displayed uh, different themes um, and different information, and these are the five that were focused on the main cultural periods. Now, in fact, each one of these cultural periods can be broken down into smaller and smaller increments depending on your location, but this is the basic stuff, and that's how I'm going to go through it today. We have the Paleo period, um, which goes back to 15,000 years ago, the Archaic, of course, beginning at about 9,500 to 3,000 years ago the artisans of the woodland. The woodland period is really when the nature coast was kind of at its height. Uh, that's certainly when Crystal River was at its height. The Mississippian period, that is European contact time period. And then, of course, the post-European contact, uh, what we call the historic period. Um, so I'm going to be going, and going into each one of those and highlighting different sites within Florida that kind of uh, provide a little bit more information about those specific cultural time periods. But again, human beings don't follow how archaeologists want things to go, right? And neither does stuff. Um, so we try our best to keep things organized. <laughs> 
All right, so the paleo period shoreline, um, it, uh, indeed, it was quite, quite far from what we, we, what we see now as the peninsula. Um, Florida was much, much, much wider and much drier. Very little water. This was during what, the last Ice Age time period. Um, and so the last Ice Age kind of faded away about 11,000, 10,000 years ago or so. But prior to that, most of the world's water was caught up in the polar ice caps. So sea levels were very, very low. And it, Florida was never a frozen tundra, um, as you picture in your minds about um, a, an ice age. It wasn't like that at all. It was just really dry. None, uh, very few of the rivers that we see um, were flowing. Um, very few of the springs that we all take for granted now that are everywhere were flowing. All of that came as sea levels started to rise that pushed pressure on, put pressure on the aquifer and the aquifer started pushing water out. Um, there was still a couple of big paleo rivers, the Oscilla River up by Tallahassee, the Suwannee, those are paleo rivers. So those were flowing back, even back then. And that's why we find large, um, not only paleo archeological sites, but archaic archeological sites along those, along those waterways. But other than that, Florida was a, a tundra a frozen tundra, um, and, or not frozen, but a, a grass-covered tundra. Um, we do see some, uh, those red dots are particular paleo sites that are um, close to uh, the, what is now called the Nature Coast, um, but that's about it in the entire state. Now, there have been paleo artifacts that have been found throughout the state, but as far as places where indigenous people lived, um, they were surrounded by uh, they were living around wet, wetlands and spring vents. So where they could get fresh water, they knew that the megafauna, the mammoths and mastodons, they were going to those locations, so the people went to those locations. Um, and I'm going to be talking more in-depthly about the Page Latson site, which is uh, on, it's actually at the bottom of the Osceola River now, um, but uh, it's up by Tallahassee, and I'll be talking more in-depthly about that. It, it uh, housed the House, is that the right term? They found the, basically the oldest artifact in, uh, in the United States was found at, at the uh, Page Ladson site until fairly recently. You all have heard the stories. Is everybody familiar with the, the Bering Land Bridge theory? Um, it, it did happen. Um, it's less a theory and um, more of a fact that it did happen, but that was probably not the only way it happened. That was probably not the only way people came into uh, populated the United States. Um, people left Africa, spread very quickly. Within about a thousand years of crossing Beringia, um, the entire North American and South American continent had been populated. So people were moving very, very quickly closer to the equator to get to some, some warm air and uh, to get to the critters, right, the, the, the megafauna following them down. Um, they, uh, the megafauna, um, were eaten out, right? They were eaten away, that they were killed um, for food. And so they didn't, they didn't, some of them may have died because of the climate changing, getting warmer, um, but most of them, people were, people were consuming them and using them. And so that's why we don't have mammoths and mastodons today, is because they, you know, were delicious, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, not that I'm, certainly not in the southeast, certainly not in, in Florida. Now, those megafauna were living here in Florida, so I, I couldn't speak for out west, but it, as far as archaeologically, we are fairly certain that they were just consumed as they were moving south, as the people were moving south. Now, again, when you get up into the, the north, most northern regions, that may have something to do with environmental uh, causes, may have caused them to, to become extinct, but I can't speak to that, really. So there are a number of sites, uh, paleo sites, the term paleo, um, and that's a complicated, that's a complicated term um, that is constantly changing. And that's one thing that is, tends to be uh, really frustrating to people that aren't archaeologists about why archaeologists can't nail down dates, can't nail down this evidence, because as more evidence comes to light, that throws the, the stuff that we had already um, uh, into chaos, or, or we start questioning that, that information. We start adding to our sort of tub of information that we have about um, prehistory uh, in Florida. Um, so 
each one of these sites has provided a lot of information. The, the Harney Flats, if you're ever driving down uh, I-75, actually, uh, you go right over. I-75 goes right over Harney Flats around um, Tampa Bay. So, you know, when you're driving through Tampa on I-75 South, you're driving over what was one of the most significant paleo sites ever, uh, ever found in the state. Um, and again, the Warm Mineral Springs down in Sarasota. Um, and Little Salt Springs is also down in Sarasota. And both of those were uh, documented. Um, there are now sinkholes um, and filled with water, but they weren't at one time. Um, Little Salt Spring is absolutely amazing. That was one of the uh, most interesting sites I've ever been to. This stake that you see in this picture, um, this was found what is now about 150, down in, 150 feet down into a, um, a sinkhole filled with water. Um, and that stake was driven into a paleo turtle shell and to hold it to the ground. So the indigenous people had repelled into the hole. There was no water in it at that time except way at the bottom. And they, there was a shelf where they had a hunting camp. And they were set down in there. They found the ropes. Archaeologists found the ropes. They found the stake. Um, and that stake certainly doesn't happen by nature, <laughs> um, and it certainly doesn't uh, get stuck into a turtle shell uh, by happenstance or on an accident. So some human being did that, and that was dated about 11,000 years ago, the wood from that stake. So um, really interesting sites that make a direct correlation to the human hand, and so a lot of these things... Uh, we try to pass off as being accidental, um, but there are ways archaeologists can tell when a stone tool has been formed by hand or it's hit another rock and chipped off. So there are, there are tells that we know of. Um, and again, I'll talk more about the Page Ladson site later, but it is pretty remarkable. This is not what Florida looked like. <laughs> not that, not that, right? Florida look like more of what we think of the African savanna now, just open grasslands, very little water, um, very few people, <laughs> and lots and lots and lots of animals. Um, and so, of course, the indigenous people took advantage of that. This is a scene from the Page Ladson site. Ooh, that's a terrible picture. Um, but again, we have uh, artist renditions of, of what it would have been like, and these were hu true hunter-gatherers. These were people that were moving from place to place, following the megafauna, following the food resources, not staying in one place too long, but constantly on the move looking for food and shelter. And all these critters existed. In fact, if you've been to the Florida Museum of Natural History, there's the, um, the glyptodon, two glyptodon skeletons, which are just outrageous, see uh, like a cross between an armadillo and a Volkswagen, like walking down the street would be totally insane, or a, a, a beaver that stands five feet tall, you know, it's these, we, we kind of have a hard time grasping these things, but these were here, um, and we find direct relations between the remains of these animals and human being made objects. Paige Latson site. So a very good friend of mine that is now a professor of archaeology up at the Florida State University, she was the one that was the diver, the head archaeologist working at the Page Ladson site. Um, they found that projectile point sandwiched between layers of mastodon dung. All right. So that's how they were able to determine. They couldn't, you can't date, you can't radiocarbon date stone, but you can uh, mastodon poop. So they were able to radiocarbon date the mastodon poop. They got, I think, 95 radiocarbon dates all together that point at about 15,550 years ago. So until fairly recently, this was the oldest archaeological site found in the United States. And it's, you know, three hours up the road. Um, and so it's very significant, um, very, very old, and now it's at the bottom of a very dark and murky river, so <laughs> I wouldn't recommend diving on it. Not a good idea. Um, I've seen many pictures of them as they're diving with alligators swimming all around and just, I'll pass. Yeah, <laughs> I'll, I'll take the word for it. <laughs> but at one point, it wasn't a river. It was, the, the site itself was a sinkhole um, and with a spring vent at the bottom of the sinkhole. And so that's why the animals went there. That's why the people went there. Um, but it's a fantastic site. And until fairly recently, uh, there was a discovery at White Sands. Is everybody familiar with this discovery that happened out, out I think it's in Arizona um, or New Mexico? New Mexico. New Mexico. 
Um, so if you don't, they found, they located a, an indigenous person's footprint, and inside the footprint, there is a piece of pollen that the foot had stepped on. They recovered that piece of pollen, they radiocarbon dated it to 22,000 years ago. So that's, that's my point, is that archaeologists, like, we stick fast. There was never anybody before Clovis Point here in the United States. That is totally not true. It keeps moving further and further back. And what we're doing, we're not trying to, like, confuse non-archaeologists. We're just trying to get the information. We're trying to gather this information and make it digestible for people to understand the world that they live in. Um, and oftentimes, uh, we end up contradicting ourselves, which is not the easiest thing for my profession. That's why I talk to nice folks like y'all, and nobody passes judgment, right, everybody? <laughs> yes, again, not, not the nature coast, but still very cool. Um, this is one of the mammoth tusks that's uh, the archaeologist uh, there holding it. That was recovered from the site. Um, here's the dive, the dive gear. That's how they did it. <laughs> There's divers in the water right there. Dated primarily through uh, delicious, delicious mastodon dung. 90 radiocarbon dates. Um, closer to home, however, we do have a few sites that are right here on the nature coast, particularly right there. And uh, this is the Chazawiska. Everybody familiar with just south of here, the Chazawiska site, and the amazing site um, that the archaeological cultural resource management company Search. Um, they, were, they were just basically dredging out a boat basin, um, and they started recovering these late paleo, early archaic artifacts. Um, and so we know that the people were there, that indigenous people were there, utilizing the environment as they did. Um, so we're getting a little bit closer to uh, where we are sitting now, um, as far as these sites are. Um, but we don't think that they were staying there for long, whereas the Page Latson site, there's definitive evidence that they were staying there for a long period of time, um, not, not at Chazowitzka. They went there, they may have come back seasonally to hunt, um, but they weren't living there. Um, there was no uh, distinct evidence of habitation, but they were certainly collecting critters, that's for sure. All right, we're moving into the archaic. If I'm, uh, if I'm going too fast, just tell me to slow down. I have nerves. I have nerves, folks. <laughs> My daughter threw a giant temper tantrum this morning because we were out of cereal, so that kind of <laughs> moved me out. <laughs> this is broken down into the early, middle, and late archaic. Um, and one thing that's very distinct about this time period is that's when we see the development of canoes, canoe technology. People were moving on the water. People were moving back and forth, utilizing what is essentially the superhighways of Florida, prehistoric, um, the rivers and the waterways, um, and certainly the Gulf of Mexico. Sea levels were starting to rise. Um, this is Shell Mound at Cedar Key. Um, this is an amazing archaic site, very, very old. Has everybody been to Shell Mound? Yeah, it's a phenomenal, phenomenal site. Um, it was found a long time ago, uh, started being excavated around the mid-1800s, um, as well as directly across, if you've been to the, the boat ramp at Shell Mound right there, um, directly across, there's, you'll see an island directly across the water, that's called um, Hog Island, um, and that's also a, a massive burial complex, indigenous burial complex, where in the early 1800s, um, people dug out really unique objects like these barrel urns. They were basically ceramic pots that were about four feet tall where they would have people buried in, in those pots. Um, and so they found many of those. Um, I think the Smithsonian might still have one of those pots um, now, but most of that stuff is long gone. But the, that, that whole area is a massive archaeological site and really important still to understanding how people were managing the change of climate even back then. Um, there was, there's evidence of people removing burials that were inland, not on Hog Island, but moving those burials, uh, digging up their uh, ancestors and moving them um, a little bit further uphill because sea levels were rising. And it's not like sea level rise is happening now um, where it's going very slowly. There was, within lifetimes, there was, there was the state was being consumed by the ocean. Um, so very, very quickly, very noticeable, and of course the indigenous people were, were uh, adapting to that as best they could. They're not lifting streets like they're trying to do in Miami, but you know, too little, too late. 
But this is the time period when pottery was invented. We're talking about 4,500 years ago. Um, there are sites out of Asia, and particularly in China and in, in Korea, where there are ceramics that were dated 20,000 years ago. So people were making ceramics over there. Um, that's not because of um, anything besides access to clay. Um, if the indigenous people, when they were here uh, 15,000 years ago, had access to clay to make pottery, they would have done it. But they, it wasn't until sea levels started to rise, the rivers started flowing, that clay became um, accessible for the indigenous population. But what's really fascinating um, is that at the same time you, you see ceramics being invented, you start to see a lot of other um, socio-cultural changes that are happening within the indigenous population. Um, you begin to see uh, people staying in one place longer. So obviously if anybody's ever broken a plate or a coffee cup, um, you know that ceramics doesn't travel great, right? <laughs> so um, people were becoming more sedentary during this time period. Populations, indigenous populations were increasing. Um, you also start to see the invention of social stratigraphy within the culture. So uh, the haves and the have nots start to become more apparent. Um, and that, that goes to happen, that starts to happen, sociologists have been looking at this for, for years, um, around the, the number of 250 people. Once you get more than 250 people, human beings need somebody to follow. We start looking for somebody to step up and, and start making decisions for us. Um, and so that, that tends to happen about this population uh, during this time period uh, with increased populations, indigenous folks. Um, and so we start to see here the first kind of steps into long-term habitation along the nature coast, um, particularly at Crystal River. Um, people weren't staying there for very long, um, but we start to see, find evidence in this area of them being there. This was an amazing site. I think it's still up at the Courthouse Museum down in, uh, is it Inverness? Um, you can go down and see the, uh, the artifacts that were recovered, so I highly recommend you doing that. Um, I actually worked for SEARCH for a very short time. Um, they're a really great organization, international now, um, and they've just recovered some absolutely amazing artifacts, including a, a, a canoe paddle, which I think is the only verifiable paddle that has been found um, in Florida. Closer to my neck of the woods is Noonan's Lake. Anybody ever been to Noonan's Lake? Yeah. Um, why do you think I would be, wh what is so important about Noonan's Lake? Anybody know? Canoe factory. Canoe factory, very good. We don't know if it was a factory. Um, but it, it, the site at Noonan's Lake is the largest accumulation of prehistoric watercraft on the planet. <laughs> and it's right there, it's in Gainesville. It's like right down the street from where I live. Um, we're not sure why. We're not sure why, if they were made there, or if it was a park and ride kind of situation. Because <laughs> obviously, as we've changed the, um, we've, we've dug ditches, and we've dug drainage ponds, and we've changed the, um, the environment to suit our needs, it, there may have been a lot more water. And actually, these lakes that we see, including Noonan's Lake, could have been easily accessible to other lakes. Um, but all the canoes are located up in the northwest corner of the, the lake. They're now under about 10 feet of water. Um, again, but in the early 90s, water levels dropped significantly. And actually, this is a plug for the Boy Scouts, a Boy Scout troop was out there um, doing cleanups along the lake and in the woods there, and one child found a, what he thought was a canoe, and he did the right thing. He reached out to the Florida Museum of Natural History, and they came out there, and they found 101 of them. Um, and so it's, um, it, it was a really an awesome find, um, and the only way that they're preserved is because of the environment that they were in. Um, they were buried in the muck, and so what had been exposed to the air um, rotted away, but what was in the mud was protected due to being in, an, in what they call an anaerobic environment. So no air was in there, um, which, which means there was very little deterioration on this. Some of these, they were in different uh, stages of deterioration, but you have here, uh, you, that one's pretty intact. And what we see is about a 7,000 year of um, changes in canoes all found at one site. So it was for about 7,000 years they were occupying this site and using it as 
a park and ride. <laughs> That's the way I, I think of it. It could have been winds pushing all the boats to one thing. I've actually talked to um, a friend of mine who, uh, his picture was at the beginning. He's a Seminole, traditional Seminole canoe maker, Pedro Zapata. Um, he's going to be, not this weekend, but next weekend, he's going to be at the um, Silver River Nap Inn, make, working on a canoe if you guys ever get down to the Ocala area. It's an amazing um, prehistoric tools and technology fair. Great question. Uh, it's about 70% of the canoes that we recovered are all uh, longleaf pine, um, and the rest were cypress. Um, cypress, if you've ever tried to work with cypress, it's extremely dense, it's extremely hard. The Seminoles used cypress because they were using metal tools, but the indigenous people prior to the, the uh, getting metal tools from the Spanish, they were primarily using um, pine because it can bur you can burn it out. So they were letting fire do the hard work rather than having access to metal adzes. I mean, they were making these with, with stone and shell tools, but utilizing fire. Um, some, uh, some archaeologists believe that at the time period where they were using the, um, the cypress, cypress trees may have been more accessible at that point rather than having to go further out to find, say, a, you know, a 20 foot perfectly straight pine tree that they could either uh, fell or, and bring to where they could construct it or that had already fallen. Cypress trees were more accessible. Um, so we don't know why there's that 30% that was cypress. Um, and there's actually a couple of the canoes that were in that grouping um, that are of un, an unidentifiable uh, tree. There wasn't enough left of them to identify what species it was. But what I've also wondered is the indigenous people were very practical folks. They weren't gonna, they weren't gonna um, work overly, uh, do overly difficult things if they didn't have to. Um, and so we have these hurricanes and trees fall down all the time. Um, so I wonder if there's a correlation between fallen trees that got pushed over by a storm and the, them taking advantage of that. They don't have to burn the tree down. They don't have to chop the tree down. It's already down and, and utilizing that. I ran that theory by my friend Pedro Zapata, who's a seminal canoe maker, and he thinks that's totally plausible. He actually makes his canoes from fallen trees in the big cypress reserve, and he'll make them on site. Make the, he'll bring all his gear out and make them where they'd fallen and then wait for um, the, the summer floods to flood it, and then he'll just push the boat out. So <laughs> work smarter, not harder. Um, <laughs> now we're jumping into woodlands. Um, so the woodland period is, is often the most kind of exciting, most vibrant period in Florida. Population uh, increased dramatically during this time period. Um, and one of the reasons is because you start to see some of these very unique artifacts um, in mostly taken out of burial mounds, um, which is very unfortunate, but that's the collection of particularly Crystal River where we've collected a lot of these very unique artifacts. Um, but this area of, of Florida was essentially the south most southern terminus of a massive trade organization called the Hopewell Interaction Sphere. Um, and basically, it went as far as, as the Great Lakes to the north over into the Ohio River Valley, even further, north, uh, t further west, and they were just trading goods. People were moving stuff all over the place. Um, we've found uh, Gulf marine shells at sites along the Great Lakes. Um, I've never been to the Great Lakes, but I don't think like um, uh, conch shells grow up there. <laughs> um, so they were primarily found um, throughout big burial mounds again, but, but at, at the Crystal River site, they found um, they found mica, which is a, a sort of a lead-like material. Um, they found galena, copper ear spools. You know how the kids have the things in their ears? Well, they didn't invent that. Um, <laughs> the indigenous people have been doing that for a long, long, long time. Big copper breastplates. There's no naturally occurring metals in Florida. Um, and so when you find metal objects at archaeological sites, they had to have gotten it someplace else. Um, the closest sorts, uh, uh, closest sorts of uh, source of mica is like the Appalachian foothills in North Georgia. So these materials were moving all, all around, all around, um, and it was this massive trade organization. So one of the things that I like to kind of squash myths, I also do a, um, a, a, the nighttime tours at Crystal River, the moon over the mounds, if everybody's had a chance to go, and that's amazing. They're not this, this month because they're redoing the the sidewalks all throughout Crystal River, believe it or not, for the first time in like 70 years. Um, 
but uh, one of the things we, we talk about is, is how, how these artifacts were moving. Um, you can jump on the Crystal River, paddle down river to the Gulf, take a right, paddle up, take another right, and you're on the Mississippi, right? And so it's like you can literally get all the way up to the, up to the north fairly easily. People walk all the time. People do it. Um, so it's, it's totally um, doable, and, and indigenous people weren't insular. They didn't keep to themselves. They were constantly moving around, um, trading things. Um, it's not until the Europeans got here that factions started to form, um, and there, there was generally a lot more violence um, post-Spanish contact. This is the paddle that was found at, um, that search found at Chazowitska. Um, it looks like a paddle, right? <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, technology doesn't change, but it's not obviously not made out of aluminum. Um, there's another one. So the, they're very rare to find these. Obviously, wood rots very, very quickly. Um, so it has to be in specific, very special conditions for wood to last, wooden artifacts. From the Deptford culture, uh, that, that is who occupied Crystal River site, is the Deptford culture. Um, and they are uh, sort of a contingent of the, um, the culture that started in Pinellas County, and oh, the Weedon Island culture. Mm -hmm. Yes? I, I work there. Oh, you do? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, nah. Not like work work, but I was in an archaeology class, and we dug up mounds there. Oh, awesome. Well, um, it's really interesting. If you, if you look at the literature, there's Weedon with an O and Weedon with an E. Weedon with an O is the site. Weedon is the culture with an E. And that was straight up a typo that was done um, in like the 1930s, and then people have just stuck to it. So now there's no, there should be no differentiation, but now because of a typo, so you know, use spell check, folks. There could be ramifications. What were you saying? I'm sorry. I just said that people are so frustrated about that. A lot of archaeologists. Oh, it's re yeah, it's so silly. Yeah, I mean, why don't we just change it back? But I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, there you go. I'll, I'll I'll send out a big email to everyone, and uh, we'll just start that that uh, we'll start that. Uh, I will. Yeah, please and thank you. Yes, ma'am. Oh, yeah, Pineland, yeah. And um, we found weeded pottery down there. Yeah. And of course, our, the, uh, the lightning routes mm -hmm. particularly were traded and found all around. Oh, absolutely. And in, in fact, um, if you're not familiar with Pinelands down by Fort Myers, we think that, say, the lightning whelks and the big shell, whelk shell tools that have been found up in this area, um, they were probably traded with, with four quahog shells um, down, further down south. Um, prehistorically, we don't think the lightning whelks were getting that big in this area, um, but they certainly were down in the Sarasota area and further south. So we think even amongst coastal Florida, folks that were living within 100 miles of each other were also trading their goods. Likewise, there isn't a lot of um, stone to be making stone tools along the coast. But what there, where there is, is inland, say the Ocala, Gainesville area, um, the, the mid-Florida ridge. That's where you're going to find the large limestone outcroppings, the large chert outcroppings. So we think that groups were trading for stone tools, for shell tools, moving back and forth. And so if you, if you kind of think about it in that way, that these folks were communicating with their neighbors um, and, and trading eggs and trading flour with other people, um, it, you know, I don't know. It's kind of a beautiful thought. People weren't hiding, running away from each other. People were talking to each other and um, seeing how they could get, get things. Um, Crystal River site, I'm going to start going into that. Um, I'm, everybody's been there, most everybody. Um, but it's an amazing, amazing site, and it's just down the way. I highly recommend everybody go back. And it, come to our next Moon Over the Mounds tour. I will be leading it. Um, it'll be great. So I guess that's it. Do I not go into it? Forgive me. Um, Crystal River was not established during the Mississippian period. It was during the Woodland period. Um, and Crystal River is very unique because of its burial mounds. It's a, it's a massive sort of civic ceremonial site. There's evidence of 
uh, civic structures like the big platform mounds relating to somebody important living up there um, or somebody important speaking from there. And then, of course, you, the ceremonial is the large um, uh, burial complex. Crystal River originally started for the first couple of hundred years of its use, it started as only a burial complex. People weren't living there year round. There may have been somebody that was there to, to manage the burials, but um, it wasn't a long-term habitation. People were just going there to bury people. So that says way more then it's an awesome place to get food, right? Um, you have, I mean, you think about the, the critters that are coming out of the Crystal River, right where it's located um, is in a brackish water environment. You have, it's about mid distance between the Gulf of Mexico and the Head Springs, which are in Kings Bay. Um, and so it's just the best Publix you could ever imagine. It's that fancy Publix on the other side of town, you know, that you always wanna go to, but you never get the, get the chance. <laughs> um, but that wasn't the only reason people chose to live there. They were living there for all kinds of reasons, primarily ceremonial reasons, or they wouldn't have been burying their dead there for several hundred years prior to actually setting up shop there for long term. And it wasn't even a lot of folks that were living there, uh, even at its height, probably a couple of hundred people were living there year round, but thousands of people were coming for very specific ceremonies. And we think at Crystal River, it was related to the winter solstice and then sites like uh, Shell Mound and Cedar Key that was related to the summer solstice. And they found archeological evidence to support that, um, that theory. One is the massive amounts of oyster shells that are at the Crystal River site. There's no way that just general living, even for a couple of hundred people, could generate enough uh, oyster debitage to build entire like 30 foot by 150 foot mounds out of it. So we think thousands of people were coming there for giant oyster parties. Um, and at Cedar Key, they were coming for giant mullet parties. Um, and I'll talk more about that in a little bit. The Mississippian period, of course, this is the, um, the time that the Europeans came into um, Florida. The Spanish came into Florida, and this was at the height of the indigenous population. There was massive uh, societies, um, especially down south in Pineland, um, and in, inland where the Calusa capital was is Mound Key. Um, I mean, there was thousands and thousands of people that were living there. Um, massive earthworks, they cut a canal using shell and stone tools, essentially for 10 miles, they were able to cut this canal. I mean, just massive amounts of effort and, and labor and manpower were going into altering their environment to suit their needs. Um, you certainly see uh, a change in hierarchy. Um, you see evidence of elites. Um, you see evidence of craft. So people were um, beginning to make craft work. Specifically, there was somebody that was an artisan that was making one type of ceramics. He makes the ceremonial ceramics. This other person makes the copper breastplates. Um, so you start to see the development of that. And what that tells us is that they had a constant, stable food source. When people have a constant, stable food source, they have time on their hands. When you have time on your hands, you make babies, which, <laughs> um, which demands more food. Um, and so people didn't have to spend all their time searching for food. They could grow their culture and start creating religion and start creating like again social hierarchies and all these really fantastic things that really started with the development of ceramics really unique artifacts and of course the spanish came completely changed everything um, there was very um, archaeologically speaking there's very little evidence of um, intense violence in florida between between uh, uh, native groups um, there's certainly, there was ceremonial violence, certainly there was war, but nothing like you see after the Spanish got there, people started taking sides. Um, and what we believe is that um, prior to the Europeans getting there, um, there was lots of room and lots of food. And it's when those two things start to be constrained that people start bumping chests. Um, and then the Europeans were, were you know, swinging influence with one group over the other group, and that's where you start to see um, things very quickly within a, about a thousand years, less than that, 90% um, uh, of the population of, of Florida, indigenous population of Florida is dead. Spanish artifacts, they were also found at Chazowitzka. Um, 
I'm not going to go into too much detail about this. I'm not an expert on myolica. Um, a lot of archaeologists call it majolica, and it's myolica. Okay. Um, that's another thing I forgot. I saw it in my bio. I'm also a ceramic artist. Uh, I went. Uh, I have a degree in fine arts ceramics from University of Florida. Um, and academically, we call it myolica, not myjolica. So. <laughs> I'm also the king of tangents, folks, forgive me. <laughs> Tatham Mound, you guys are familiar with the Tatham Mound? Um, it's a, a really big, um, it's actually an, ar one, an archaic site that is found on the, um, the Withlacoochee River um, in hitting, uh, heading east. Um, it was an awesome site. They've made, uh, it's, there's actually been a lot of um, um, historic fiction written about it. Um, there's a couple of romance novels about the Tatham Mound, ladies you might be interested in. Very, very good stuff. Um, but it's, it's a really amazing site that was occupied for um, hundreds and hundreds, if not a thousand years. Um, and they've located uh, loads of Spanish trade beads at this site. Um, that is actually the main archeologists uh, excavating there. And that's also a terrible picture, forgive me. Could I ask you instead, um roughly where that is on the Wicca Uh I don't know. It's, I don't know. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Okay, there you go. <laughs> East of Inverness in the cove of the Wicca Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah, and I think actually the mound itself is on private land, or, or is it, it's all on water management land? Um, so, it's there, it's been very well documented, and again, that, that is associated with what they call the safety ha harbor culture, which also takes its namesake from down in Pinellas County. Um, so, and uh, that's another thing, not only did archaeologists um, kind of create five distinct time periods and try to lump all of Florida prehistory into <laughs> these, these five boxes, but when it comes to artifact identification, we've tried to do the same thing. Um, we, we're trying to keep these things organized, but that's not how humans work. So a safety harbor culture means they were making ceramics that were indicative of ceramics that were found at sites in safety harbor. That doesn't mean that they are from safety harbor. That means they may have traded with groups from there. That means that it may have come up with the same uh, way to make ceramics in that same way. Um, so th this is the same thing with projectile points. If you've ever find, say, a Putnam point or a Hillsborough point, that doesn't mean they were only made in those counties. That means the man that, that um, Ripley Bullen, this archaeologist, the first the man that created these, these namesakes, um, that was the first place he found those points, right? And then so, but, you know, Pinellas points have been found all over the state. Um, um, likewise, other, other types of, of um, artifacts have been found in different places that aren't uh, as easily identified. All right, jumping into ceremonies. Before I do that, does anybody have any questions? Everybody good? Everybody still awake? I know I'm talking. I talk a lot. I talk a lot, very fast. Um, we're going to talk about what this means by ceremony. Um, and so I think it, I'm going to ask... Um, if it's possible to kind of push away our uh, kind of Eurocentric ideas about what we feel is valuable in our ceremonial um, lives, uh, what is valuable in our religious lives, um, and sort of um, don't let that shade how indigenous people did their things. They looked at the world completely different than us, and I think that's one of the biggest um, areas that is lacking in education about indigenous populations is that they had a completely separate worldview from, from us. Um, ours is very much centered in how Europeans uh, looked at the world, um, and theirs was not. And so that's, that plays into how we, um, we look at their heritage sites. What are the clues that, that help archaeologists better understand ceremony in prehistoric Florida? Material culture, site design and features, um, case in point, Crystal River site. Um, this is a, a, a typical Whedon Island um, ceremonial vessel. Um, this is what they call a mortuary vessel. Um, this was made by an artisan to put in the ground. It was never made to be used. It was made to be put with a burial. Um, 
Likewise, as was this, this was uh, actually, this pot whistled, they believe this pot whistled, um, but this was another ceremonial mortuary vessel. So at this time period, um, when, when we start to see the development of these ceremonial centers, you start to see the development of these kind of really specific objects that were made for burial only. To be buried with someone? To be buried with someone, yes sir. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, these are really unique. They found about a thousand of these at Crystal River. This one's made out of a, um, a whelk shell. However, they found them made out of quartz crystal, hundreds of them made out of quartz crystals. They're called plummets. We have no idea what they were used for. Um, we think that Crystal River may have been sort of a, um, a trading post for these plummets because of the quantity of objects found there, but no evidence of manufacturing of those objects. So just like the canoes, um, we, you would, if it was a manufacturing center, archeologists would have found um, canoes in different stages of construction, um, but we didn't. And uh, we didn't find these, these tools or whatever they were used for in different stages of construction. May perhaps, but out of quartz crystals, I mean, these are beautiful, highly crafted objects. We think, we think that they were adornment, and so they were tied to elite's clothes. Um, so you imagine jingle jangling all around, you know. Oh, here comes the, uh, the prince wearing his jingle jangle plummets. Um, um, that is a wooden artifact um, that came out of a site um, called the Key Marco site down in South Florida. Um, and that is one of the largest groupings of wooden artifacts that have ever been recovered. Um, it's around, well, Marco Island. Um, and it's about this big. The actual artifact is at the Florida Museum of Natural History. Again, I encourage you to go have a look at it. But because of its unique environment, that site, that's why we have all these wooden artifacts. Um, and there's giant bird effigies and all these things. And most of the artifacts are actually at the museum on display. The famous Key Marco cat. Anybody want to, if you, if you know, don't answer, but anybody want to guess how big they think that is? No, it's like that big. Yeah, it's like this big. Yeah, yeah. I think to the top of the ears, it's nine inches. <laughs> so <laughs> all the, the license plates, oh, actually, we're working on that. Oop, I shouldn't have mentioned that. It's just one turned, yeah. Um, so yeah, the, it's one of the most, um, recognizable artifacts out of Florida indigenous cultures, and it, you know, is this big. <laughs> What's it called? The Key Marco cat. Um, and it's not, a, it's not like your traditional tabby cat. It was probably a panther, right? These are some, that's my other one. Um, that is uh, another artifact that is at the Florida Museum of Natural History. Again, all coming out of the same site. Masks. Um, uh, very ceremonially um, uh, important to these groups. Um, a lot of times we find those associate, uh, in fact, they found several associated with the, uh, the mullet feasting at, at Cedar Key. Um, so I'm not speaking to indigenous um, spiritual you know, lore, I don't know, I, it's not for me to speak to it, but they were certainly important, altering who, the perception of who you were as an individual, um, taking you to another plane, that was all something that was very important to the indigenous people. Crystal River again. All right, Shell Mountain Cedar Key, we're gonna talk about this really briefly. Um, it is an amazing sort of horseshoe shaped um, feature you can see the up, the, the high, uh, so um, Hog Island is like right here, right here. Um, but this is the, the mound itself, um, and it was built on these relic parabolic dunes. So as sand dunes, and, and as um, sea levels were changing, um, and even as that was completely underwater at one point in time, there was dunes that were made, and they were all facing this one direction um, to the, the southeast. Um, so the indigenous people recognize that, and so they use they utilize that um, as part of their their ceremony um, and to construct these mounds. Um, we believe that the actual what they call a a plaza or a gathering space for religious and social gatherings was in the center here. 
Um, and this, this mound was built over hundreds of years, um, and there was probably different uses um, for it over those time periods, but it was all ceremonial, um, and it was all extremely significant. That's very famous, uh, so, well, the side of it, people run up and down and it's completely eroding the shell midden. So this is all made out of oyster shells, essentially, um, what they call a midden, which is basically cast off um, items from daily use. So mostly oyster shells, there's broken ceramics, um, there's broken stone tools, et cetera, animal bones, lots and lots of stuff that's piled up specifically in a very specific way, in an in intentional way. One thing that's really significant is just south of Cedar Key is this, has anybody heard of this site, Richard's Island? For real? It's awesome. I mentioned earlier about the mullet feasting that they had at Cedar Key for the summer solstice. Um, this gentleman actually came up to me um, several times at, uh, at events I've done. Um, and this was just adjacent to his property. Um, and he used to kayak back in there. And he said, I think I got this archeological site, this big archeological site on my property. And could you come out and look at it? And I was like, oh yeah, you know, I get that all the time. Yeah, I'll try to get out there, get my kayak. And like, there's no other way to get out there. Um, I'll try to get out there. And um, you know, I never did, but then he brought it to Dr. Ken Sassman at the University of Florida and um, a doctor, um, Janessa Mahar, at the University of Florida, and, and they both said really something similar. Yeah, we'll try to get out there when we can. Um, then they finally did, and they were blown away. This was a constructed mullet trap <laughs> to catch thousands and thousands of mullet at one time. Um, what they call mass capture technology. Um, they dug these natural pits. There's these natural um, pits in the limestone. Right here, this is a shell wall. All right, this is all midden. So the indigenous people built this wall here. It was open there. At high tide, the mullets swim in. Low tide, they can't get out. At at, um, at Shell Mound, around the same time that they were discovering this, they were doing excavations at Shell Mound where they found these massive um, uh, cook pots, basically. They were these huge vessels. They found eight of them um, that were, they were basically in the ground, um, and they were filled with remains of mullet. Um, and so they think that they were cooking, roasting these mullet, boiling, however they were doing it, inside these cook pots. They were just very quickly made ceramics. They weren't ceremonial by any stretch. Um, the, the, the vessel itself, um, very quickly made, very quickly manufactured, no decoration, set in the ground, um, and they were just filled with thousands and thousands and thousands of mullet. So we believe that there is a, a gathering for the summer solstice, and they were utilizing the mullet for feeding all these people. How do you know it's from the summer solstice, you ask? Inside those containers with the mullet bones, they found juvenile ibis bones. Juvenile ibis bones. Um, then the archaeologist went to some zoologists and said, OK, this, this ibis is only at this stage of growth at one particular time of year. They were all the same, right? All the bones were of the same age. Um, and they said that's around the time of the summer solstice. So that's how they were able to articulate that it was specifically this feasting was happening around the summer solstice because of those juvenile ibis bones. And they've said that you can't eat these, these ibis. They probably weren't for eating. It would be like eating, um, you know how like you eat a quail and you're like, this is way more work than I'm getting meat out of it. It would probably have been like, <laughs> yeah, like I can go get a chicken. Um, it probably been similar to that. So they, we don't know if they were eating them. There was no evidence of them being cut for, um, for you know, consuming, consumption. But they were certainly in the cook pots, and there was probably a ceremonial thing to that. They would go harvest the juvenile birds, um, cook them up for these ceremonies, and that's how we be began to tie it, uh, tie the two things together. And what's really fascinating about archaeology in general is that sometimes it takes those little those little clues and that, that you finally put those dots together. Um, again, if they would have just put some sticky notes on some stuff, we'd probably have a better idea, but we couldn't. <laughs> yeah, I know. And then I guess back to making pots for me. Um, so again, I, I forgot that I go into the Crystal River site, so I probably told you all of this stuff already um, about Crystal River. 
Um, it's a really awesome site. Um, it was originally uh, excavated by uh, Clarence Bloomfield Moore. He was a, um, uh, an antiquarian, um, a wealthy elite from, the, from Philadelphia area. His family owned um, paper mills and he didn't want to go into the paper company. He, he didn't want to go into the family, follow the family fortune into the paper world. Um, he wanted to be an antiquarian. So he um, went through school, bought himself a boat called the Gopher, um, and he basically would get um, local informants to tell him where the indigenous burial mounds were. Um, and he would go and he would dig them up. Um, and he was actually hired by the, the big host institutions, or the big institutions that we know of, like the Smithsonian, the Philadelphia Field Museum, the Chicago Field Museum. They hired him and men like him to go up and fill up their museums. That's how they, that's how they acquired all this stuff. Um, and I'll talk more about that later. Um, but now the indigenous people want their stuff back. Um, and that's, that's um, a very, very long, very complicated issue. Um, but he was the first person, he wasn't an archaeologist, and then later Ripley Bullen in the 1950s began to actual excavations. Um, and both of them had a fault. Um, they didn't recognize the context in which these artifacts were found. Um, that's what archaeologists, um, that is our main goal is to identify context. It's not the individual artifact that tells us anything. Uh, an arrowhead can tell you a little bit, um, but where that arrowhead was, if you found the arrowhead next to say a deer bone or a charcoal pit, um, then you start putting clues together. So it's, it's how that artifact is in context with other artifacts and the environment around us that truly tells the story. And both Ripley Bullen and C.B. Moore just ripped the artifacts out because that's what they were driven by. That's that's what they were interested in, not necessarily how the humans intended that those things to be. Talked about this already, the uh, Cosmopolitan Center um, and how, um, how Crystal River was the, what, sort of this, this massive trading post. Um, copper pan flutes. Where else do you see pan flutes? Greece. Greece. The Andes. Right, the Inca. So people, people, indigenous people all over the world uh, found solutions. When they had a problem, they found solutions in very similar ways. Um, we did not find, archaeologists did not find um, the actual flute part, but they found the copper sheath that went around the flute. Um, copper ear spools, copper breastplates, all these things were found at the Crystal River site. That's Galena, mica, of course, and here's one of those crystal plumb bobs. Um, I might be wrong, but uh, that's a little too fancy to put on the end of my cast net, right? <laughs> you know, purple, perfectly carved quartz crystal um, that, again, is not found in, in Florida. Yes, sir? On the underlying map in South Carolina, you have a fossilized shark tooth. You know what I'm talking about? Mm. Yeah. That's a great question. Um, that, that, I did not realize that was a fossilized shark's tooth. So <laughs> I just put that, that, that image up there. Um, so, but they did use shark's teeth um, for, for drills. They used shark's teeth for cutting implements. Um, there was some weapons that were found that, that, that were embedded with shark's teeth. But yes, I, I do not know if they used fossilized ones. Oh, that would be awesome. Yeah, I have, I have no doubt. I have no doubt. And, you know, that's one of the things that we need to keep in mind is, is um, they couldn't just go to Walmart or go to Publix or do the, like these things that we take for granted now. Everything they wanted to do, they had to find in the environment around them. So if they found a material that they could alter that would suit their needs, like a fossilized shark's tooth, then they would do it. Yes? Oh. One hundred percent. And actually, um, what those two gentlemen that dug up the burial mounds at Crystal River um, did note is that the array of different artifacts that people were buried with, that it wasn't just beautifully crafted ceramics. Um, they found people with very, uh, like surrounded by very rudimentary shell tools. 
um, they found people surrounded by very plain ceramics, like nothing fancy or ceremonial. Um, they found people uh, laying on beds of oysters, um, covered with blankets of oyster shells that were at once woven together. Um, and so, yes, yeah, so the, I think they're speaking to um, the particular trades when you see things like that. Like maybe this gentleman that got buried, maybe he was the, the group's shell tool maker, or maybe he was like the best oyster picker upper that you know that they had um, but yeah absolutely absolutely right exactly exactly that's an excellent point and I think that's one of the things I was sort of highlighting about when I mentioned about how let's kind of take our mindset out of this this the way we look at fine things um, because it, it may not have been the case for for the indigenous population <laughs> but they did sport those big old juicy ear things you know, which I would never do. <laughs> uh, this is a really interesting pot. This is called black and white pottery. There is a, a, some of this found at Crystal River um, where the pattern that you see is actually the, um, the clay, the natural clay body, and then they put a black slip on top of it. Um, and so where you see a lot of that is in the desert southwest. Um, and so there's no direct evidence that there is um, trade between the groups that are in the southwestern United States and into Mexico, but there's a lot of hints that they were either talking to each other or they were influenced by things that they'd seen in their travels um, because that you don't find these pots anywhere else really in Florida. Um, and this, is, again, is talking about that cosmopolitanism, uh, that cosmopolitan idea that we see at Crystal River. Um, this is a very similar design to the main burial complex at Crystal River. It's a large circular embankment where there are burials. There's a cleared area and then two or sometimes one conical mounds in the center. Um, this is in Ohio. So... Um, Hopewell, Hopewell, Ohio is an actual location, and that's where they kind of got, they coined this idea that they started to notice these artifacts that were from far, uh, far away from Ohio. Um, but so it's not just the artifacts that we find that tell us that this trade was happening. It's how uh, this, this interaction, I should say, was happening. It's how they designed the specific features. So when you start talking about ceremony, either somebody walked up to Kentucky, Kentucky, the Ohio River Valley, and noticed that they were doing these kinds of things, or somehow word got down to Crystal River because they built the, the burial mound at Crystal River just like they were doing up in Kentucky, in Ohio. Um, and towards up towards the Great Lakes. So there was, they were seeing how people were doing things. That means they were interacting with each other uh, far more than just you know, like, give me your shell, I'll give you this galena, like, all right, you know, kind of thing. So they were talking, they were communicating, they were sharing their spirituality, sharing their purpose. I don't know if anybody's been early a long time ago at the Crystal Riverside. Does anybody remember this? Anybody visit? This was called the, um, the window to the past, and it was actually dug into the side of the burial mound. And you could look inside those plexiglass windows and you'd see a skeleton with a, uh, a, a piece of pottery. Um, they, uh, they actually got rid of that well before NAGPRA, the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, was passed. And I'm very happy for it because personally, I wouldn't want anybody staring at my grandmother in the little note that I left her, but <laughs> call me weird. Really quickly, Crystal River at a glance. Uh, mounds C through F, that is the main burial complex right in the center. You have Mound G, that is also a burial mound. Um, it's distinctly different. It's what we call an atypical Florida burial mound. It's just a mound, round mound. Um, whereas the, the main burial complex is this more uh, planned um, architectural feat um, and, and less so just a mound. But they were built at the same time, which is really interesting too. Um, we have Mound A and Mound H. Those are the large platform mounds um, that are completely diagonal from each other, and probably there's probably ceremonies that were happening at the same time. Um, this area right in front of Mound H is called the plaza, um, and that's probably where people gathered. Mounds J and K, those are small midden mounds, platform mounds as well. You have midden B. Um, which uh, goes all the way into the next, uh, the neighborhood that's just adjacent to Crystal River site. And that was probably the, the living surface for just the regular folks. It's about three feet in elevation. So it's been high enough to keep them 
uh, dry, even uh, unless it was one of the worst flooding, um, you know, incidences. Um, but also it allowed a breeze because you know the noceums are just, and I'm sure they are t here, just absolutely <laughs> wicked. Um, it's too bad we don't cover ourselves in mud and bear fat anymore, you know, because I could see how that would be really um, helpful and attractive. <laughs> Mount A, I'll kind of rush through this. I know I've been talking a while, um, but it's 30 feet um, in height, uh, and, and, and it's always been the same size. Um, and it was first recorded by C.B. Moore in the 1900s, and he's the one that gave the names of the, the letters, and it was how he encountered them. So he came to Mount A first. Um, and then he didn't even see Mounds J and K because it was too overgrown. Um, that's a shot my wife took during uh, one of the Moon Over the Mounds tours. Um, this is, as far as I know, this is the only picture, and, it's, and it, I uh, uh, apologize for it being a poor, poor image, but this is the only picture of the mound prior to um, them bulldozing a third of it for, um, for landfill next to it um, to build a trailer park. Um, and so that is a little boy sitting on the ramp. You used to be able to, there used to be a ramp. There was obviously no stairs. <laughs> the indigenous people didn't have light, nicely LED lit stairs that go up to the top of the mount. Um, there was a large shell ramp. Um, this this uh, used to be called the Spanish Mount. Um, this is from floridamemory.com. You guys familiar? Or it's uh, .org. It's like the state of Florida has this um, database of just thousands and thousands of historical pictures. I highly recommend checking it out if you haven't. It's awesome. You can just get lost in it. Mount H, large platform mound in the corner, excavated by Ripley Bullen. Um, the ramps that go between Mount H and Mount A um, are completely diagonal from each other. And then, of course, you have the stele. Um, everybody's familiar with this. Is anybody familiar, not familiar with the rock at Crystal River? <laughs> so it is a carved rock. Um, it is Probably the most controversial thing um, that came out of the Crystal River site, um, and that blows your mind, doesn't it? Controversy related to an archaeological site, um, but it is. It, in fact, I don't even do. I don't even stop at this this rock on tours anymore because um, it's too controversial. We have no idea. We don't know any information. Barely any information about it. Um, that is sort of the image that they believe is carved onto there. Some people say that's a face. Some people say it's a map. Um, some people say it's aliens. Some people say uh, a kid from the 1920s did that with his pocket knife. Like, we have no idea. Um, I believe it, the indigenous people did do it. Um, actually, there's a local archaeologist by the name of Gary Ellis who runs Gary Gulf Archaeological Research Institute. Um, he believes it's what, it was basically a greeting. So, uh, because just on the other side of this rock is the burial complex. So it was either greeting people welcome, you're coming into a ceremonial spot, or warning, you're coming into a ceremonial spot. Or some kid in the 1920s carved it with a <laughs> pocket knife. We have, we have really no idea. Um, there was some uh, excavations that were done underneath it, and they did, f or just like right here, and they did find some burnt charcoal and some broken pieces of pottery, so that might suggest that it was being used for ceremonial purposes. Underneath but, the rock? Just adjacent to it, like right okay. there. Okay, like the rock. Uh, well, and the rock actually goes down about three feet into the ground, so it's a massive chunk of um, of stone. There are some historic accounts of a gentleman who who liked it in the 1950s and wanted to take it home, and he wrapped a chain around it um, and tried to drag it to his his um, his uh, you know his house, um, and he couldn't do it. Um, and so, if that's the case, if this isn't the original location, then that throws in the question all of the astrological um, kind of ideas that have come out of it. Um, so we, we just really don't know. But I've seen it written. He's like, ah, I tried to drag it. I couldn't get it but 10 feet, you know. And so <laughs> um, it's a massive piece of to rock. And actually, a part of it broke. There used to be this other part, um, and a tree limb broke off, um, broke off a chunk of it, and it, that had engraving on it as well. Um, and then the former park ranger threw it into the woods. <laughs> Crystal River. It's all so controversial. That's it, guys. Thank you.